Very kind of you. <clears throat> and thanks for, uh, am I on? I don't know. Is that okay? Uh, thanks for engineering this whole connection with, with Kern, uh, Dr. Magnuson. Uh, I have done a lot of things. I've done them all badly, by the way. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can do a lot of things if you have no standards. Just uh, <laughs> excellence gets in the way, you know, but uh, you can cover a lot of ground. Um, <clears throat> by the way, there are two of these. Um, one is Legacies of a Great Inheritance, and one is Israel and Legitimacy, Modern Achievement, and Islamic Prejudice. So um, this comes from the Kairos Journal um, team. Let me say just a little, uh, a little bit of background about where I'm coming from. Uh, with regard to Islam and, uh, and Israel um, today particularly. Um, 48 years ago, I first went to Israel in 1967. I know you don't think I'm a day over 40, but just roll with me here. And uh, back then, um, the Mount of Olives was in Jordan. And to go from one part of Jerusalem to another, you had to use a passport as you went through the Mandelbaum Gate. And uh, so when you're up in the Jezreel Valley, you have bunkers by the Kibbutzim because you have artillery from the Syrian Heights, the Golan Heights shelling. It was a very different world. The next summer they had the Six-Day War where they took the West Bank and Golan and, and Gaza and Sinai. So there's, there's that background. And since then I've been there I think seven times now. Most recently with Dr. Dr. Wills and Dr. Schreiner and we had, a, we had a tour there and in Jordan. And I was a guest of the Israeli Defense Forces on my, I think my sixth trip where we went to listening posts on Golan and looked down into Syria and went to the drone base in Gaza and so forth. So a lot of, a lot of time in Israel. Um, one of the wonderful things about being a Southern Baptist is you take a lot of mission trips. And so uh, I've been to Khartoum twice, uh, bike, biked up the Nile from Luxor to Aswan with nights in Isna, Kamombo, and, and Idfu, witnessing as we go up there. Um, with Kairos Journal, we've worked with people who have been run out of Pakistan because they're Christians and they settled in Australia and been per persecuted for vilifying Islam in a church talk. Um, uh, we've worked with uh, Peter Akinola, the Archbishop of Nigeria, who brought me 18 hours of videotape on PAL format and we put them into a 15-minute video about all the persecution in northern northern Nigeria, uh, Boko Haram, in uh, Jos and Kano and Idfu and Kaduna. Um, I might or might not have a, a, a son who is on the mission field somewhere, I'm not supposed to say, uh, somewhere around Southeast Asia and been out there to see him four times where there are a lot of Muslims. And So it's one thing after another, climbed Mount, Mount Sinai and snuck around the back streets of Khartoum. And, and so I, I'm, I haven't been a full-time missionary and I haven't been a, an Arabic scholar, but been around. You know, I stayed in the Holiday Inn Express last night, and so I'll, I'll do my best. Um, we're going to have to think fast and talk fast, uh, uh, but uh, I've got about 25 little PowerPoint slides, and I've got some video to watch at first. But let me just introduce this first thing and say that um, <clears throat> when I was there with the uh, IDF folks, um, we were coming up from, um, from Galilee up to the Golan, all the way up to the top of Mount Hermon, and uh, our guide, uh, he was actually a general uh, from the Israeli army, pointed back down the valley as we were climbing. We were going uh, around towards Caesarea Philippi. And as we looked down in the valley, he said, by the way, this was a malarial swamp um, under the Ottomans for hundreds and hundreds of years. And you've heard of the Marsh Arabs down at the bottom. And you remember in Iraq and how Saddam mistreated those guys at the confluence of the, you know, the Euphrates and Tigris and how, and they just kind of worked these little, pole boats in and around and lived in the marsh and they, he, he was nervous about them so he drained the swamps and so forth. Well they had marsh Arabs, marsh Bedouin up north of Galilee. You know the snows of Mount Hermon ru um, melt and they run down s through some wonderful uh, streams but then it just kind of settled. There was a big basalt hump down at the end of the valley and a bridge whose columns were too close together and it just jammed it up. And it turns out that um, it's about 20 square miles. It turned out that no one could really go in there except the residents. They wove mats to sell, but you got black fever, swamp fever, yellow fever, what have you. The Israelis, after 948, took it over, uh, and they drained the swamp, and, uh, and it, they turned it into something of the breadbasket of Israel. Uh, had a lot of papyrus. They actually drained it too well, and um, you had all this peat that had been built up through the years, and once the oxygen hit it, Every once in a while, like a spark would light it, and it would just burn and burn and burn. So they had to, like, raise the water level in places to keep the thing from burning up. 
And then the environmentalists went crazy and they said all the migratory birds used to love to stop there. Instead of flying across the Mediterranean, they would work from Europe down into Africa there. And so they uh, got a national park in the southern part of the Hula Valley, like Hula Hoop, okay, or sometimes H-U-L-E-H. And uh, so they, um, they have a park down there now, and it's a beautiful place, and they have wetlands and migratory birds and observation points and, and water buffalo and so forth. So everybody's happy uh, there, and it's just an example of how, uh, how Israeli ingenuity just jumps in and says, hey, and by the way, I think it was like 9 billion gallons of water evaporated every year from that. It just sat there, couldn't get out, and, uh, uh, and it just evaporated. Now they just sluice out of there and they're able to, you know, irrigate all kinds of stuff. So we're going to look at a little footage. Uh, I, I did an aesthetics course for, uh, for the uh, online department, and they gave me a camera and said, wherever you go, shoot stuff. So I shot aesthetics, but I also shot some of this. By the way, a quick ad. Uh, this is going to be kind of snarky toward Islam, okay? But I want to tell you, it's, it's not a triumphalistic thing. It's a heartbroken thing. And, and I've done a fair amount of evangelism with Muslims. I uh, had lunch with a Kurd a couple of days ago that is a friend I'm working with in Nashville. And a little ad, we're taking the Detroit mission trip on spring break, the Bevan Center. And each time we go up there, we go to mosque. We were with Shiites last time. I was with Sunnis with the Nam thing. So if you have an interest in American Muslims and reaching out to them, um, my wife will be in the lobby here and she'll be signing. No, that's not true. The Bevan Center will sign you up. Let's run the video. It's about four minutes of video. And I'm just going to talk you through. I guess I need to get down here. Is this going to mess up the sound system? <clears throat> if you look up here, this is very amateurish. But I'm driving along the Hula Valley here. We're driving in the Hula Valley. And um, that you can just see, this is not a malarial swamp. This is all, that is not the right place to go. <laughs> um, so anyway, it's just all kind. you have all kinds of orchards and crops and so forth and so on. And it, they have just transformed it into a food source. Um, it's, you know, you can see the Golan in the distance. I mean, it is pretty stark and dry. <clears throat> but down in this, uh, in this lowland, uh, just any number of things. They have flowers and they have uh, bananas and Sharon helped me, my child bride Sharon here of 40 something years. What, what else did we see growing down there in the hula? Uh, eucalyptus. Eucalyptus, yeah. Oh, here we go, here we go. Um, this is the very highest quality, quality video. It's a handheld uh, thing shot by moi. Um, but as you're getting a little, it will get a little bit higher, and you can look down and hear just, just row after row after row after row of stuff. Um, and I'm thankful. I, I didn't mean to sound snotty about the environmental movement. I'm glad, I'm glad that you've got that kind of balance, and these guys uh, uh, pled for it. As you get down into the, uh, into the Hula Valley, they have a, a, a kind of a video center, and you sit in there. Uh, and it's like all sense around. They have chairs that jerk around, and then they have guys flying, I guess, with ultralights in the middle of geese or something. And so when they, when they move, you're, you're going like that. You're in the goose thing. And then, like, they'll go through a crowd, and they'll spritz water in your face. And um, So I've flown uh, to the Hula Valley or through the Hula Valley. Now we're in the National Park, and we're walking across this bridge over toward... I do not have a steady cam, by the way. This is... Uh, this is it. But as we head up the sidewalk, you just see, you know, a lot of uh, vegetation. I think those are eucalyptus trees up to, uh, up to the left here. Don't tell Spielberg that I have a camera. He'll enlist me. You see in the distance the dry hills. Those are over on the western side. And as we go up uh, this valley, then you see the, and it's just, you know, nasty water and just this is what you'd get from a wetland. I mean, that's just like catnip to migratory birds, or maybe migratory cats. I'm not sure. Um, and uh, as you look in the distance, there's a water buffalo. They have uh, uh, some of the original guys there. And then this is a bridge people use for observation. Um, that, was, that was weird. I don't know what that part was. But uh, you could see Golan in the distance. But here I'm walking through a narrow bridge to the rushes. Uh, this is the way it used to be before you could grow everything under, 
under the sun. And then we come across a bunch of catfish here. And um, I think I was inebriated that day or something like that, but those were fish swirling around. And uh, then as you get on this bridge, you have these people observing wildlife. And on the walls, you have uh, the key to what kind of bird looks like what. And you just sit. Now, then you go farther south, and uh, we're, we're out of the wildlife area. This is the Dead Sea Works, OK? Uh, they have discovered potash in the southern part of the Dead Sea. Uh, an Israeli, I mean, a, a Russian engineer found this back in the, uh, uh, like around 1800. And ever since, a lot of people have invested in this, and they've almost, by evaporation beds, almost pumped the bottom of the Dead Sea uh, dry. If you look in your old Bible uh, maps, you know, you believe the Bible from Genesis to maps. If you go back to maps, you'll see that lisan, that tongue that sticks out into the uh, Dead Sea. And um, anyway, um, it's almost, the bottom half is almost dirt now because they've done, these, they have Filipino and Thai um, guys coming in, and this is the Ataba. This is the Jordan Valley Rift that goes all down, you know, the lowest part on earth. This is like lower than Dead Va Death Valley. And it's just been, it's on the edge of the Negev. It is just desolate. And now there are hundreds of farms and kibbutzes, and they have these um, uh, kind of plastic things they put over the, uh, uh, over the crops. And uh, then you, this is a kibbutz where we stayed. Um, and they bring these guys in from all over creation. Uh, they have all this irrigation stuff. In other words, the Israelis have taken this desert that's been desert for millennia, and they're making the desert bloom. And I would argue that this comes from a Judeo-Christian heritage, unlike an Islamic tradition or heritage, if that makes sense to you. Could we maybe, just for my... For my uh, peace of mind, lower that and project. Can we project something? Right? It's not working. Okay, all right. Uh, as they say, the devil is in the uh, always in the PA system or something like that, uh, or AV system. Um, I'm going to race through some some slides and try to say why I think it's a different thing. Now we talk about all kinds of dangerous, crazy things done by Muslim extremists and Islamic extremists, and we'll touch on that a little bit. But it's rather the normal Islamic nature of the countries that I'm going to talk about today, that the center of mass of Islam is not conducive to human flourishing. Uh, the Judeo tradition, and you'll find this, and by the way, there are these two books where we spell all this out. The Judeo-Christian tradition is actually uh, salubrious. It contributes to human well-being. And so I hope by these, uh, I can go back down and do that. I hope by these... Um, slides to kind of make the point here. So let's track through them. I, I don't have a fancy thing like, or maybe I should just do that and say next. <laughs> okay, next. <laughs> this one is a little more complicated, but bear with me here. <clears throat> On the left is a, is a classic picture of the Christian God. He's kind of like the geometer of the world. And he's the guy who, uh, the guy, he is the, he is the Lord who has designed a very orderly and wonderful and law-like world. And, and on, on that basis, and by the way, he's benevolent, on that basis, then we can have natural science, we can have confidence in, in testing and so forth. Um, Alfred North Whitehead, who was n a no Christian at all, basically said that modern science depends upon a Christian or Judeo-Christian base. I mean, part of it, is the God is not impetuous, he's not like angry, like the gods are angry and that's why we have thunder and he may be angry today and not angry tomorrow. Um, Rather, and, and by the way, he's benevolent. So in sciences, in, in doing the sciences, we're, we're almost like running down stairs on Christmas morning, uh, you know, wondering what presents we're going to open. Like, oh, here's a new tree. Let's, let's take the sap and run it through a lab or something. Whoa, it cures something, you know. So we just, we're just constantly excited about what we'll find. Uh, the Muslims are more leery about that. I mean, I know that there have been Muslim scientists, and I know that, that uh, you know, whether it's like the overflow of the Nile, they trust that and work with this and that. But there is a big body of thought in Islam that suggests that when we talk about laws of nature, then that's like a threat to God. You know, it's, it's impinging upon his, upon his goodness. And the same thing goes with morality. Um, the natural law tradition says that it, it basically is kind of sweetly reasonable. You know, you don't break the Ten Commandments, you break yourself on the Ten Commandments because they are life-giving. But an Islamic approach is more of uh, God just kind of fires from heaven and says, do this. And you think, well, I don't know why. What do you mean why? You don't ask why, you know? 
uh, I was looking through, this is the chief uh, guidebook to life in uh, Southeast Asia for Muslims called the Reliance of the Traveler. And every time I read this, I just, it, it's like, it's offensive to pray in the presence of food or drink one would like to have. Unless one fears that the prayer's time will end, it's, offen it's offensive to interlace your fingers when praying. And I, he's never been to prayer meeting at a Baptist church. We have potluck. But if I'm looking at that chicken and we're saying prayer, well, we've offended or something like that. It's offensive to speak while lovemaking or when in the laboratory or relieving ones. I mean, they just got everything. If you're going to bet on a race, if a camel races a burrow, then, you know, whatever. Or if you and this gal had the same wet nurse, then if you marry, it's incest. And it's like, what, what, what? But see, that's kind of beside the point because Allah has spoken. There is an authority, and they don't, they, it's, it's a fiat ethic in a sense. And there is, in our tradition, more of a natural law feeling, whether you're Thomas Aquinas or Carl Henry, that the, the, the instructions of God and, and uh, the deliverances of science are just, just, it's just sweetly reasonable and perfectly reasonable. And it, it kind of puts a, puts a jam on them in a little, a little bit in developing and thoughtful ethics and so forth. Click, okay. Um, we're driven by the creation mandate, Genesis 128, be fruitful, multiply, exercise dominion, you know, uh, subdue the earth. And God says, have at it. Um, that's a picture by Thomas Hart Benton of, of Harvest. And they, they have harvesting there too. But there's a greater sense of fate. Um, and there's not that same sense of, of uh, I, I guess you could say, holy ambition and industry to get. And so you have this kind of silly thing, Nike, Arabia. Just do it tomorrow, you know, inshallah, if God wills. Uh, it's just a more laid-back kind of thing. And as I talk to missionaries who work there, they, they kind of adjust. They're, when they get over there, they're all wired and like, we're going to meet at 8.30 and we're going to do this and that. And then you kind of, either you have a nervous breakdown or you relax. And you kind of you learn, learn a little inshallah and so forth. So that changes the culture and human flourishing. Next, uh, the state of, of women. Huge thing, huge problem. Um, you've got the, uh, the kind of the traditional wedding one with one uh, over here, and then you've got the, I couldn't resist the guy from Malaysia over here in the lower right-hand corner, this big, big old rascal with his happy gals giving him food. But uh, polygamy is a big problem in Islam. Um, by the way, in the lower left-hand corner, we have women scientists at the Weizmann Institute, and um, that thing, if it went a little farther, you'd see an Israeli woman soldier who's delivering uh, life-saving materials to a Palestinian who's been, who's been wounded. Um, there's a lady named Noni Darwish who um, came to a conference we had in Vienna. Uh, Kairos Journal sponsored a conference. It was a secret conference with about 100 people. We met in a castle above Vienna, and they brought in heads of state and, and Jewish and Catholic and secular people. We had people from the Polish parliament, the Italian parliament. We had... Uh, Melanie, uh, what's her name, uh, the Jewish writer for one of the, um, Melanie Phillips, who writes for one of the London papers, and uh, she wrote a book called Londonistan. She was there. Uh, Archbishop Akinola from Nigeria was there, and, and just all kinds of interesting. Former president of Spain, Osnar. And uh, we talked about um, um, just all kinds of difficulties. that Europe is being essentially overtaken uh, in many cases by, by Muslims. I mean, the British city of Bradford, uh, Banlieu in Paris, and they're saying, we're saying to them, you can't, you can't stop Islam with secularism uh, for a variety of reasons. And by the way, you don't get Europe out of secularism. You get Europe out of a Judeo-Christian base. And one of the ladies there was named Noni Darwish. She was the daughter of an um, uh, intelligence officer for Egypt, and they were running raids out of Gaza into Israel before 1967. And they tried to take him out. Israeli co commandos did. They came to her house, and Dad wasn't home. And they left everybody alive, untouched. Dad's not home, we go back. And uh, they later got her dad, and they came back to, to Egypt as um, kind of heroes, family of the martyr. And so that sounded great. The government put them up with a stipend and the like. But then she discovered her mother, who was a widow, couldn't have... Uh, married friends, because if she goes and visits a married friend and the husband comes home, then she said, and he might say, whoa, that's pretty good for wife number two or three. And so they're very skittish about that. And married women can't have single friends who've never been married, so it's very hard. All that intrigue you see in the Old Testament about where you have 
couple of white, that's, that's just replicated. Will my son be the favorite son? Will your son be? And so you get to these little rivalries and read a book called The book, Bookseller of Kabul about a guy who's a bookseller and he finds a younger woman, takes a shine to her, sends his old wife, the wife of his youth, back to uh, Pakistan to run the depot while he runs the retail in Kabul and just the heartache that comes with that sort of thing. Um, it's a terrible thing what's happened to women. The women's, women's testimony under Sharia law is half that of a man. Uh, if you want to get a rape conviction in Pakistan under the Hadush laws, you have to have four male witnesses to the rape. And if you fail to sustain the charge, you may be charged with adultery or promiscuity or, or whatever because you've admitted to having sex with a guy, but you didn't make your case, and you're in trouble. Some Arab nations are better than others, some not so much. Is, uh, polygamy is illegal in Egypt, but it's done anyway, kind of like the back streets of Utah. Uh, it's, it's done, and the treatment of women is not, it's not great. Uh, the Judeo-Christian approach is much healthier. Next, please. I put this fear factor in here. I mean, I think that Muslims uh, like to be fierce. ISIS likes to be fierce, and, you know, we're strong and confident and the like. But to me, it's one of the most cowardly religions. I can imagine. I mean, they're terrified that they're going to see a woman's ankle or, or that uh, some guy will preach the gospel freely. Uh, and so they keep a lid on everything. I mean, you just say, can, can you really not handle it? I mean, are you afraid that if, if we turn evangelism loose in, in Egypt uh, and Jordan and so forth, then it's all over? And I think it would be, chances are all over, because they keep the lid on. And look, I, boy, I agree with Mary Moeller's book on modesty, and there's a lot to be said for modesty. But, uh, you know, we can kind of handle it, uh, honestly, if, if women don't wear long sleeves. Now, I do show some, uh, some Orthodox guys here who say, please don't come through our neighborhood without wearing long sleeves and a long skirt. And sometimes these Orthodox guys get a little crazy, and, you know, they, I think they harass this 8-year-old girl for dressing Im immodestly. And I think that says more about them than the 8-year-old girl. But they, they had that, but it's marginal, and it's kept suppressed in, in, in Israel. But there is an enormous uh, problem for women with regard to their dress in the renewal of, I mean, you know, just all kinds of movements in the, in the, uh, in the Arab world. I also have a thing about evangelism. It is tricky in Israel to be openly evangelistic. They're very twitchy about demographics and whether, you know, they get a Jewish... Uh, uh, critical mass to hold their democracy in a Jewish place. But here's a, here's a Christian evangelist witnessing to some uh, Israeli troops on the Golan Heights. On the other hand, you don't have outsiders evangelizing. You just have Coptics who just want to live in Egypt. And so you have Coptics under fire. Why are you so afraid of Christianity? You know, what, what is it about, about it? If it gets loose, then, then the game's up. Uh, we, on the other hand, and in Israel, it's like, go ahead. You know, put your religion out there. Write a book. Follow Allah. Sacrifice cats. You know, go out and howl at the moon. Whatever. Take your best shot. And there is a confidence. We do that. There's a confidence in saying, we can handle that. We can handle that. The Islamic world is terrified. I mean, all right, click. Constitutional democracy. It's the only democracy in the area. So we have kinship with Israel. You have Assad and... That's Sisi in, uh, in um, his last name, in Egypt, in the middle. He was a general. He took over. He's much better than the Muslim Brotherhood. But, um, you know, I really like Abdullah in Jordan. He's got a lot of gear on. I can't imagine he's been in that much battle. But, but at any rate, a lot of gear. And, uh, but he's, he's the king, you know. And then you've got a pretty good guy who came out of the military down there in, up there in Lebanon. And then you've got Israeli politics, which is a zoo, you know. It's just every kind of party and and the like, and uh, that's what we do. It was a zoo yesterday, it's a zoo in Israel, and we embrace the zoo. And that free marketplace of ideas where you can defame each other and brag on your stuff and fly this flag and fly that flag, that is awfully important for human flourishing and development. Otherwise you become insular, broken, it's a free market thing, in a sense, and it's just, it's just so controlled in these other places. Next, we hear about the Muslim street, uh, look, there's a street everywhere. There, there's Occupy Wall Street, and there are tea partiers, and there are, uh, you know, what have you. The quality of the street's a bit, bit different. And here you have a couple of pictures. One is of a, a woman and a young man celebrating on 911 as the towers were burning and falling. 
I submit to you that if, like, the big tower in, uh, what, Dubai falls, you're not going to have people in the Israeli street dancing around like that. Or if a house collapses in Palestine, you're not going to have dancing and, you know, what have you, what have you. And then it seems like the Arab street really does like to have guns. You know, this is a Palestinian thing. AK-47s show up regularly, uh, and you have firing there. I had a prophet at Vanderbilt who once talked about a fellow. He said he has no epistemology. <laughs> That's an odd way to put it. But it says there's no filter. There, there are no standards for rationality or something. It's just anything goes. There's no uh, hard question about what counts and what doesn't count or what's reasonable. There's a, a shortage of epistemology in the Arab street. Like, oh, yeah, Jews did 911 so that we'd react again. Or, hey, or in Nigeria, uh, polio vaccine, that's, uh, some imam will say, that's a Western tradition or Western attempt to kill our people or something, give them all polio. And, ah, you know, and the next thing you know, they're killing vaccine guys, you know. It's, it just, it's just kind of whack. Now, there is an, there is an Israeli um, um, protest there. Uh, during the Gaza incursion, some of the Israelis said, Hey, let's not do that. And they hold up signs, but you got these old guys, middle-aged guys, just kind of leaning on the barricade, like, "Hey, we got a sign back there. Read it." There's there's a different quality of the populace, and it has I think it has a lot to do with the fact that fewer than fifty percent of the women are literate in Egypt. That uh, they're just not they're just not as well read, and and there are just a variety of things that contribute to it. But the Israeli streets a lot more like our street and Western streets. Okay. The Sheikh's Dilemma. There's a wonderful book called uh, Startup Nation and, uh, by Dan Senor, and he talks about various things in Israel that are entrepreneurial and quite exciting. I mean, he talks about things with electric cars and the Hula Valley and so forth. And he says, you'll have the Sheikh's Dilemma. The Sheikh is the ruler in, uh, you know, in, the, in these areas, and he wants his nation to progress and you know, have a great airline and look cool outside and be respectable and so forth. But he doesn't want a dissent, and he doesn't want a whole bunch of people getting like too educated and too smart and too uppity and so forth, or too powerful, because then he's threatened. It's a power-based sort of thing. It, and so you have Assad and the Saudi prince there. But then you look to the right, and this, this appeared in Haaretz, which is the leading uh, sort of left-to-center Israeli uh, newspaper, which means the earth. All right? Bereshit bara Elohim et Hashemai and vehet Haaretz. And God created the heavens and the earth. You all know that, Hebrew guys. That's Bibi Netanyahu in the cockpit flying into the World Trade Center. And the cartoon said, Netanyahu, you're doing more damage to our relationship with America than, you know, you're making an enemy of America more than the real 9 fly flyers made an enemy of themselves with America. Well, that's a snotty thing. But you know what? They can do that. And they could do a Muhammad cartoon. And they could do, a, they could do any kind of cartoon in Israel. And there is that sense of, you ain't my shake, you know? I mean, we're just, a, we're, we're just a bunch of guys who can say what we jolly well please. And as messy as it is, as awkward as it is, uh, it is absolutely essential for, I would say, cultural health and growth. And by the way, I think that's one reason the Southern Baptist Convention has had a resurgence, that we just didn't turn the whole thing over to an episcopate or, you know, some really grand guys at some really small group that meets once a year. It's the gong show. I mean, you know, when we had 55,000 people there, uh, you know, in Dallas and people driving up from Little Hope Baptist Church in Bodka, Arkansas or something, and they've got as many votes as First Dallas, and you can take that mic and say, I don't like what you're wearing, you know. Messy. But, boy, uh, let, let the people do their thing. Let them talk. And, uh, and, by the way, I would say at the local congregation, too, uh, but that's another whole, whole thing. All right, so what's next here? I can look here. Oh, just a, just a look. That's not entirely fair, but it's the only picture I could find. Pre-1948, Hula Valley, Marsh Arabs, Marsh Bedouins, great people. None of this, by the way, is meant to reflect on Arabs or whatever. They're God's creation, loved equally with us, ingenious, wonderful people. This is about Islam, and it's like this blanket that's fallen on people and, 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 and produced squalor. I mean, there, there are quotes all over the place. I think it's like the manufactured export of the entire Muslim world from like Mauritania to Bangladesh is less than that of Finland alone. Uh, they had Nokia phones or something like that. Now, they, a lot of oil, but that's, we're talking about manufactured stuff. It's like the reverse Midas touch. When Islam comes in, it produces squalor. Now, there are a lot of wonderful, kind, hospitable Muslims, but in terms of 
flourishing of society, it's the reverse Midas touch. It, it is really sad. And then you see the Israelis with their 1940s gear digging up papyrus, you know, trying to make that farmland. Okay, what's next? Free press, kind of talked about that. Netanyahu is about to speak. He's just walking into the lion's den. You know, on the other hand, you have Jordanians who have tape over their mouths. And Jordan's a wonderful place as far as that kind of culture goes. But boy, they limit their press. And so they're saying, this is not fair, what you've done. As much as I hate a lot of stuff that's in the press, I mean, you know, just give me a New York Times with Paul Krugman and, and uh, uh, what's the redheaded gal's name? Um, uh, the columnist. Um, Marine Dowd and others, and you just, you know, and then, I, and then I turn on and there's, you know, what have you, Rachel Maddow or something, and I just say, oh, Lord, you know, but thank God we've got a place where you can do that, but you can also do a limbo and so forth and so on. It's just, it's messy, but it's necessary for flourishing. Okay, what do we got here? Yeah, so this guy came over from America, a Jewish fella, and when he was over there, he decided, he invented a desalinization process. Uh, and they had these big desalinization uh, plants on the shores of Israel, and he decided to stay, and it was some kind of very fancy thing. It's like a, a reverse osmosis, nano, you know, ferret something. I don't know, and it was fancy. And he stayed, and so they produced that. Well, you don't have that being produced in Jordan or Egypt and so forth. Now, Jordan does have a little desalinization of the Dead Sea, but it's not with their technology. If you go into the Arnon River Valley on the east side, kind of over near Sodom, and so it's in Moab, you will see a, uh, a dam now. And you can see the water, the reservoir down below. Uh, and it's really a beautiful place. It's in a really desolate place east of the Dead Sea. It's, it used a rolled concrete technology, which was developed in northern Italy and perfected in northern Canada. And then you go there. Well, they're smart to pick up on it. But you, you don't develop technologies in these areas. You pick up on them. And I'm glad they do. And I'm glad the dam's there and they use that for irrigation and they need it desperately. But I thank God that I live in a tradition that actually comes up with technologies, you know. And you don't get saved by technology, you know. It's not that you stand before Christ and he says, what have you got? And, well, I'm from a place that has desalinization plants, you know. Good enough. Come on in. Now, it's, it's, there's no means of salvation here, and it's not a guarantee of virtue, but it's good stuff. Uh, what else we got here? This is a little snarky, too, but we had a comedian, a Muslim comedian, come to Chicago, and he said the only thing a Muslims export um, is uh, ouds and olive oil. That was one of his lines. Well, ouds are these little things like that, and olive oil is that. Now, that's not <laughs> quite true, but... Israelis, through the Weizmann Institute, they work on childhood diseases. Um, that's a computer that involves photonic something with uh, quantum computer. I don't know what this is here. I have a diesel computer, and I, you know, I just, <laughs> it works, but the fumes are terrible. Um, the guy in the lower picture is in a, some sort of experiment there, and um, it's at the Weizmann Institute. It has to do with MRI or magnetic resonance stuff. So they're doing cutting-edge science that then they give to the world. Not so much. In, I mean, I like foods, but all right. Next. <laughs> this looks pretty ominous. Uh, one of the things we got to do when we went to the IDF is that we, we saw the commissioning of the paratroopers at the Wailing Wall to the Western Wall, like at 10 at night. Very solemn thing. And as they step forward, they give them their rifles, and then their shirts are unbuttoned, and they slip a Tanakh, the Hebrew Old Testament, in their shirts. Um, now, there are a lot of secular Israelis, and they're not like, wait, we're supposed to take that hill. Let's get out, you know, Leviticus, see what Deuteronomy, don't cut down fruit trees or something. And, you know, but there is a general ethos to a place that rests on the Tanakh as opposed to the Quran. And this is a, this is a fighter on the other side. Next. Uh, one of the things they teach the Israeli army is purity of arms. If your nation is terrorist, if they're giving cash prizes to mothers, to mothers who have given their children to blow someone up on a bus in Tel Aviv, you have a morally impoverished nation. You can't flourish with that kind of thing. And here you have two, well, I saw this, I couldn't resist the thing at the bottom here.
But here's an Israeli soldier protecting a baby carriage. Here is a Palestinian soldier hiding behind a baby carriage. There is more truth to that. That is not just a joke. I mean, they will, they will put their stuff in, in places we don't want to shoot. <coughs> On the far side there is um, a Hamas leader's car who was hit by um, a rocket uh, from a drone. On the other side is a Hamas driver who is driving into a train stop, uh, a light rail train stop in, in uh, Jerusalem, killing a child. It was the firstborn son they'd been waiting for for a long time, killed a baby. And uh, as sometimes I say, uh, these folks can blow up, a, blow up a car, they just can't build one. I mean, there's no Islamic car, you know. Now, there are Muslims who work on the assembly line in Detroit, and I'm not saying they're unable to turn a screw, but in terms of everything that goes, and Francis Schaeffer's made this point, everything that goes into science and technology, the rule of law, an educational base, um, uh, you know, just technological learning and all this kind of stuff, even a good work ethic, you just, it's hard to get it together in a Muslim country. It's it just, now, I have to, I'm going to make champions of Islam out of all of you. I'm being so offensive, but just bear with me here. Let's press on. There is an honor and shame culture instead of a guilt and blame culture. When I was in Jordan, in Amman, I think for the second time, the queen of Jordan's campaign, well, well let me, first lady campaigns first. Barbara Bush. Huh? No, that was Nancy Reagan, drugs, just say no. Barbara Bush was literacy, Michelle Obama is good food or whatever, Lady Bird Johnson was highway beautification, you know, they each have a project. Hers was, stop the honor killing of your family members. Because the jails of Amman, this is Amman, this isn't Saudi Arabia. The jails of Amman, or some people say Amman, were filling up with terrified sisters and nieces and daughters of people who might have looked wrong at an infidel or, you know, rode on the back of a motor, ridden on the back of a motorcycle or something, and they have to protect them from being killed. So you have the case of the, the uppity girl who got her nose cut off, and then you have this cab ad. If, you're, if you sense an honor killing coming, call this number. In our culture, I don't care if it's embarrassing your family. The question is, is she guilty of a capital crime? This family, it's a, I, I get McLean's magazine, it's a Canadian magazine, and there was about an eight-page article about this family. The daughters were uppity, and they were flirting with non-Muslims, and so the son, who's at the top, took them out in a car, and uh, they didn't know what was coming. It was a Mercedes, I think, and with the encouragement of the mother and the dad, drove it off into a canal, jumped out at the last minute, killed his three sisters. That may work, and pardon me, that may work in a part of the world. That doesn't work in Canada. We work with a different system, and it's not enough that it was an affront to your family's dignity or your religion that you can kill somebody. In, this, in Jordan, maybe it's a problem. Whatever, not here. You know, don't come here. All right, what else we got? Refuge for Jews. I talk a little bit in one of the booklets where we talk about the whole thing, the Palestinian issue, and whether the land thing is this and that. One of the things Israel says is we are the only place on earth where a Jew can come. If you're one-fourth Jew, one grandparent, the same principle Hitler used to kill people, then you can come to our place and so they have come from all over the place. In many cases, they've left their property. It was confiscated. They come in. And the, the movie, The Voyage of the Dam, was about a ship in 1937 came to America and said, bad things are happening in Europe. Can we stay here? We turned them away. They went back to Europe. Over 200 of them died in the death camps. This is a place of refuge for the Jews. And, and, if they, and it's a democracy. <laughs> So if you have like a whole different demographic and you've got a bunch of people coming in and all of a sudden you're not in the majority, then it becomes Egypt or something. You know, it's all over. So they are very protective of their, and they bring them from Ethiopia and Russia and the like. And um, if, you have, if you have issues about the Palestinian, we write about that. I can't go into all that right now. But by the, by the time of national um, um, independence, they had bought 30% of the land, just bought it from Ottomans. In fact, Jaffa was a neat town on the coast, and they said, well, I don't know, could we have maybe some of that swampy land down on the, down on the seashore? And they said, okay, some old Ottoman sold it to them, and it's Tel Aviv today. You know, they just do that sort of thing, all right? We're almost done. Uh, racial equality, there are Muslims in the Israeli parliament. Here are two Muslims in the Knesset. 
I wasn't really nice in picking the other picture. These are Islamists uh, in the uh, Egyptian parliament. They're not looking too inspiring. But you could probably go to the Kentucky legislature and get a similar shot. I don't know, or certainly in Tennessee. But at any rate, there are no Jews in the Egyptian parliament. If you're, you Forget that. But the Israelis say, look, if you got the votes, come on. And they have served as uh, oh, ambassadors and Supreme Court judges and so forth. And there are actually Muslims in the Israeli army who are snipers and trackers and stuff like that. What else we got here? Uh, very simple thing. Property is a real tough thing to come by in Egypt, real estate. Uh, not so much in Israel. So I've got the Century 21 Israel sign. I went working through Google Image to find an Egyptian real estate company, and I found one, but it's actually Southern Illinois. It's called Lower Southern, you know, like the Salukis. Is, that's the dog for SIU because it's an Egyptian dog. But it's hard to own property. If you don't own private property, it's very tough to get a quality of life thing going. And Egypt is very short on that. Almost done here. Um, universities are the 400 top universities in, in the world. There are several listings of these. There are four of them in Israel. You know, Yeshiva, I mean, um, uh, Tel Aviv U, Hebrew U, uh, the um, uh, Ben Gurion University of the Negev, and then uh, Israel Tech, so to speak, Technical Institute. There is none in the surrounding countries around Israel. The only thing that comes close is the American University in, in Beirut and the American University in Cairo. But it, now you see that fancy building on the side. What happened is in Qatar, in Qatar, I think it is, or the UAA somewhere, they built this big building and they invite American universities to come over. So Northwestern, Michigan State, there they put a lot of security around them, but they import Western, University of Exeter in England. That's kind of how they have to do it because they don't have a tradition of free thought. And by the way, if your women can't do it and your infidels can't do it, you're really limited I mean, you, you, you cut out the Madame Curies and the Amelia Earharts and, and, you know, Christian Bernard, who did the first heart uh, transplant, he was, uh, uh, he was a, a philanderer, you know, and, and, and yet we'll think, well, yeah, but if he learned something, you know, let's learn how to do heart transplants. And I know Hitler got behind the Volkswagen, but I'm going to buy one, you know. It's just like you get your good ideas where you can. But if you shut off all the people who disagree with you, then you're going to be, you know, retarded as a culture. What else have we got here? Um, oh, a real quick thing. I was going to read, I did a thing in this book I did on moral apologetics about a huge embarrassment that came on, uh, on the Arab countries. You had an Australian paper publish a list of the countries that came to Haiti after the earthquake in the first 10 days, two weeks. And there was no Muslim country on it. I mean, it was Israel. Everybody was sending something. French were sending sniffing dogs to go through rubble, and we were sending in pallets in C-17s, and others were doing tents and all this stuff. And with all the money they had, there was, there was none. So they got embarrassed, and like they looked around in the couch, I think, in Saudi Arabia, and found a million dollars and sent it in, and somebody... I mean, they finally got hustled up. They do not have a compassionate tradition Americans are crazy with that. You know, somebody, Franklin Graham's over there with a Navy or something, and next thing you know, it's Banda Achi, it's this and that. Uh, we founded the Red Cross, essentially, Henry Dunant in Switzerland. There is a Red Magen, you know, the Red Star of David, um, like Mogan David Wine, Mogan Star of David, not drinking Mogan David Wine, I'm just saying. And then you've got uh, the Red Crescent, but these are after type thing. And, these are both in Haiti. They finally got over there. The Israelis got there early. Red Crescent comes in, but it's a huge problem. There is not a large heart toward the world, the same that you see with America, I mean with the Western world. And symphony, very quickly, I think, I, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll talk real fast. There's a Cairo symphony. God bless these guys, you know? And look what they're playing. I mean, they're playing Mahler and Rachmaninoff and Sibelius and so forth. There's an Israel symphony. But you think, well, that's nice. I mean, symphonic stuff, that's Western stuff. So maybe the Israeli symphony could play all the e Egyptian symphonic. Uh, no, there's not. There's the one they played. Somebody had an Opus One, and it was like an oud with a symphony. And I mean, every once in a while. But you think, well, yeah, but that's Western art. Well, then let's do all the other art. The arts, very short word, the arts are, are not flourishing there uh, in painting. and so They don't have church music, you know? You'll go down uh, Devon Avenue in Chicago, and 
uh, there'll be a, a Jewish uh, uh, shop there, Judaica, and you'll have a little Northwestern University uh, yarmulkes and little shofars and Seder plates, and then you'll have a klezmer band and some cantor chants and so forth. You get down to the Muslim shop, and you know there's like Cat Stevens, uh, who became Yusuf something or other, and then there's a boy band from Malaysia, I think, and a fatwa is on them somewhere, and they're running around, and it's like this. You go to a Christian shop, you can hardly find a book anymore. It's just music, you know. And, I mean, now MP3s change that. We're the singing culture. We sing about a lot of stuff. And so, and, and not, only, not only the music, but just the instruments. I mean, you just think about it. Double reeds, bassoon, oboe, brass, you know, trumpet, trombone, cornet, French horn, and on and on and on, and stringed instruments, and viola, and blah, blah, all that richness. That comes out of the West out of a Judeo-Christian tradition which loves ingenuity and loves music and there are all kinds of instruments that even make the cut. Crumb horn, sack butt, recorder, they're not, I mean that's really a thing, I'm not trying to be naughty here. Uh, what else we got here? Comedy, we're almost done, I keep saying that. <laughs> After 9 -1 -1, there was this documentary about the Muslims are coming, we do comedy too. And there's one joke the lady said, yeah, she was in a bar, and she was drunk, and she saw an Israeli guy that looked kind of good, and she didn't know about going home with him to have sex, and so she says, W-W-A-R-C-O-D, what would Arafat and Ravine do circa the 1923 Oslo Accords? Bang, that's the joke. But that was about the funniest thing I heard. But I'm thinking, you tell that joke in Tehran, you're toast, you know? Uh, they don't laugh at themselves so much. They can't afford to laugh at themselves or each other so much. It's very, very dangerous. Among Jews, I mean, where do you go? I mean, what is that? Is that Sandler, Franken, Seinfeld? I think that's Peter Guest down there. You got John Stewart and Stiller and Jack Black and, you know, what's her name? Just died, uh, Joan Rivers. And you got Sarah Silverman. It just goes on and on and on. That tradition of laughing at yourself is something we shouldn't take for granted. And laughing at others, you know, that sort of thing. It's, again, part of the freedom. Is that the last slide? Good. I'm sorry. I talked too long. But I just, in terms of the sciences and um, just laughing and orchestras and irrigation, and, and it's, it's just, and it's not because um, Jews are, um, by virtue of being Jewish, going to heaven or something like that. It's that... The biblical base, that God, all men are made in God's image. Be fruitful and multiply, subdue the earth, and so forth. Just the wisdom of the thing. A man who is, it meditates on the Lord God, he's like a tree planted by rivers of water. He flourishes. And then you read the Quran, and you read Reliance of the Traveler, and you think, how in the world can you get life out of this? So missionary work to Muslims is to increase the Muslim population of heaven for sure, but it's also an act of mercy to bring to them a, a, a worldview that will bring life to their country. Um, I'm a, I, questions? I'm sorry. I said I'd stop at 1230 and just felt a sermon coming on. And had to, we have time for a couple of questions? Yeah. Yep. Uh, so with uh, the, the Muslim advance of Aristotelian philosophy how do they view that it's really that's very interesting because if you look at you know they talk about the golden age of islam and we read uh guys like averroes and avicenna or ibn rushd uh, different different names and uh, by the way uh, president obama talked about this sort of thing actually in the in the kairos talk you remember he made early on and there was a time when um they were piggybacking on western culture in many respects and they appreciated aristotle and he had a kind of common sense approach and there's some somewhat sensible things that were said in the early days. They also made great stone inlaid dagger hilts, and they do great calligraphy and arabesque and steel for surgical instruments, and they borrowed stuff from uh, India and numbers, and so we have algebra and algorithm and so forth. But it was kind of like a cut flower thing. They were relying upon others. You'd conquer a people, and then you'd appropriate their stuff. It's a little bit like Christians saying, Christianity is so smart. I mean, look at Ben Franklin. He was in a Christian nation, and he did the lightning rod or something. Yeah, but he wasn't a believer, but he was in the deal. So, um, yeah, there's some sensible, useful things said. I mean, we were just reading in 
philosophy of religion the other night a little bit of, uh, I think it was Avicenna, no, it was Averroes, and he was talking about differences in interpretation and kind of a natural law thing, but under the pressure of all this other stuff, it just kind of fell apart. And when they talk about the golden age in Andalusia and, and the like, um, you know, they, they can have peace in a way, but it's the peace of submission. If everybody kind of shows up for work and says, yes, sir, and they pay their, their the, the demi tax and all that, you can kind of have hegemony and some things will show up. But there are books written like what went wrong, you know, so like 600, 700 around there, they were, and then it just boom, boom, boom. And you wake up today and it's just, they just played out the string. Yeah. Yep. What evidence remains from North Africa to the transformation that went on there, say from 300 to 100 KD? You know, um, by the way, the pyramids, they didn't build them. You know, that's the big tourist thing in Egypt. Like, yeah, you guys didn't build these. But um, one of the real heartaches is that a lot of the early church stuff and, and even the letters to the churches in Revelation, all in Turkey, and, you know, Chalcedon and Alexandria and so forth, just incredibly rich stuff there. But um, they kind of like, except for the tourist trade, they kind of like to say, you know, year one is when we took over. And, and, and by the way, it's not a religion of peace. I mean, they came through 100 years after Muhammad's birth, death. They went 1,000 miles east to India, 1,000 miles west to Iberia, 100, 500 miles north up toward the Balkans, and 500 south of the Upper Nile. And they just came in, and sometimes they appropriated something. They would just say, the church in Istanbul, that's our mosque, you know. Um, and they tore by, I don't know if that's exactly what you're asking, but you see traces of where the um, Anchorite fathers were in bits and pieces, but it's, these are ruins. Uh, I, yeah. You talked about <clears throat> the mess is kind of evidence of human flourishing and stuff like that, that we have kind of the crazy right and left. Right, stuff. right. <clears throat> Can it ever go too far? So yeah. I'm thinking about Facebook, right? And yeah. So, um, everybody having a megaphone at this point. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh become, yeah. And now, and now, since everyone's got a megaphone, it seems like there's nothing. Like reason has ceased to, to hold sway. Oh no, it's insanity. And by the way, um, but thank God now we can we can do our preachments. In <laughs> in other words, things are insane, decadent, pathetic. I mean, we strengthen Islam every time I think Lena Dunham goes on TV or something like that. It's just there's such sorriness and madness and so forth. But on the other hand. We can have uh, Franklin Graham come on TV, or we can have Dr. Moeller, or you guys, and so game on. And uh, one of the wonderful things is Romans 2, 14 and 17 says that the, the Gentile who has not the law, the Torah, has it written on his heart with his conscience accusing and excusing. So there is a sense of, of just sensibility that we can play on here in and, and the gospel. I think the answer for us is like awakening. I mean, it's just Whitfield again you know, 57, 58, prayer revival. That's the, that's the hope of America getting it together. But still we're a place where a Whitfield can rent a stadium and do that. You can't do that in Egypt. So that's our hope. I, I don't know. Yeah, okay. So it would be quick for a year. Ah. Mid-90s. Mid and I remember it being about four or five years after Desert Storm. Yeah. And a lot of the young people, pre-teens, early teens, were starting to dress and look yeah. American fashion. Right, right. If you fast forward to the first part of the 21st century, we can see women in the Kuwaiti parliament for the first time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so kind of going back to the same question on Facebook, do you see any cultural opportunities for us to yeah. break the ground a little bit to connect the gospel out? Yeah, I mean, just a couple of quick things. Uh, when I took a course called uh, War College uh, in the Army, one of the guys said the most dangerous thing uh, in the developing world is a Sears catalog that, you know, it's not like a fancy weapon, but once they see this stuff, so there's that, that kind of allure. There's a huge embarrassment, humiliation. So some of the guys who are doing the worst stuff are some of the richest and most privileged because it's an affront. But the nations are very, very different. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Indonesia is very syncretistic and it's kind of, except in Aceh province, is a very laid back sort of thing. Uh, Saudi Arabia, fierce, you know, Iran, pockets of Western, uh, it, there's a great revival actually in northern Iran 
based out of actually London. They have a lot of stuff coming in there. So you'd almost have to go country by country by country. But what happens sometimes is you have the Arab Spring, you have a little bit of that, hey, we're going to kind of do democracy. And then it goes badly, you know, and they kind of snap back. So I, long term, it's hard to bet on that horse, uh, I think. Look, Henry, I'll say this. I, I did, when I was editing SBC Life, I interviewed Henry Blackaby. And, well, they had prayer leaders, Henry Blackaby, Doug Betts, uh, Manette Drumright, for the different agencies. And it was like 1993, and the Iron Curtain had just been collapsing. And Henry Blackaby said, before we started, he said, uh, there have been two totalitarian foes of the free spread of Christianity on earth, totalitarian communism and totalitarian Islam. And he said, one down, one to go. And I believe, I, this Kurdish guy I work with, he's about to talk himself out of Islam right now. He says ISIS is not extreme. ISIS is Islam. He says th that's what came up into here and made this area Islamic in, in the 700s. He says, this fringe stuff, are you kidding me? But um, one other little thing I would say is one of the problems with Islam is when you have this e the extreme, well, those are just a small part. Well, look, I mean, a small part of Baptist witness you know, but it doesn't mean witnessing is not part of the Baptist core. I think these guys are really getting after it. Um, but um, the problem is all the other guys roll over. You know, it, I heard Bridget Gabriel the other night. She's an Islamic convert, kind of with Ayan Hirsi Ali and others. And she said, uh, you know, yeah, 90% of the Muslims are happy cab drivers and good neighbors and all that. She says they're irrelevant because when the others do their thing, they get out of the way, either through fear or just self-doubt or just, just disinterest or whatever, uninterest. So I, yeah, I just think as long as that's the book, it may bob and weave a bit, but I think it's going to have to be a worldwide forsaking. But boy, God bless you. By the way, my son was in the Iraq War twice, and so he would dispatch back, and, and he, he works with Muslims, and he loves them. And we can love these guys. But boy, getting them out of bondage is such a dream. I, again, I don't know. He's got. I, I think that's yeah. all the time we have. But let's thank Dr. Coppinger. Thanks.